morning, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you so much for joining Corset Research and Tracks for today's webinar on how COVID-19 is highlighting the opportunity for autonomous monitoring of on-shelf availability. Today, we have David Gottlieb, Managing Director of Tracks on the line. And with that, I am going to hand it over to our host, Deborah Weinswig, CEO and founder of Corset Research. Anna, thank you so much. We're so excited to be here today. Uh, you've got myself, Deborah Weinswig, and my co-host, uh, David Gottlieb, who is the Managing Director of America's Tracks. He has, and David was amazing. He flew out to Vegas to join me on stage at ICSC. We had the CEO of Guess, we had the president of Tapestry, and his insights were amazing. So I, I just want to tee him up right up here. Um, so he has extensive experience with retailers and manufacturers uh, throughout his career. And at each phase, as I saw on stage with him, he really helps identify cutting edge technology to improve operations and enhance the shopper experience and really deep industry knowledge around artificial intelligence and you know just kind of what retailers need when they need it and really how, kind of how to help them. So very impressed. So today we're gonna take some time to go through an amazing, um, I would say survey that we, we worked together with Tracks to uh, field last fall. Obviously a lot has changed since then, but really the core findings here are probably even more important as it relates to store operations. And so we're going to dive into the, the details here today. And one of the things that was the most interesting, and <clears throat> I've, I've spoken about this throughout my career, is how important on-shelf availability is, right? If it's not on the shelf, you can't sell it. And a lot of the you know, kind of technology that we've seen over time has been around this specific topic, but we feel that you know, the retailers who worked with Tracks have had you know, significant positive experiences and conversions. And so we're gonna talk about that today. So with that, we'll, uh, David, thanks again for joining us. Um, so we'll, we'll kind of go through some of the slides and then I'll turn it over to David in terms of our format. Uh, for those of you who have questions, on the bottom of the screen, there is a Q&A um, kind of uh, tab and we'll work to address those after the, the formal aspect of the presentation. Uh, we will have this video up for those who would like to see it and we'll also have a transcript available. So thank you everyone for joining us. We'll uh, kind of jump right in. So I, I love the title is how computer vision can save retailers uh, from costly in-store execution issues. And I think that, you know, what we've seen here is um, some, you know, kind of poor in-store execution over time. And, you know, and especially right now, it, it's so challenging for retailers. Uh, we'll talk about store operations, challenges and their priorities, uh, the role of technology in store ops, and then just kind of our key insights, our key findings. And I think that, you know, what we've, you know, kind of continued to see um, as the chart will show you is that, you know, poor in-store execution can easily lead to issues such as um, infrequent stock replenishment, uh, misplaced SKUs, that can be a real challenge. And right, there's a, oftentimes we'll be shopping for bread and you know, we find cookies, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, but you know, that idea of, you know, kind of product that's been misplaced and then Another uh, challenge is this non-compliance with planograms, uh, price and promotions. Um, and this really starts to um, challenge stores because especially if you're a consumer shopping many stores, if the planograms all look a little bit different, uh, that can be confusing to the consumer. And also in many cases when uh, CPG companies have worked so carefully with retailers uh, to build out a certain planogram and it's not properly executed, uh, we don't necessarily see the sales volume. So, here we look at the you know, kind of sales lost uh, to poor in-store execution. And you know, kind of what we see here is 51% you know, of respondents said that you know, kind of 5% to 15% of sales um, is most often uh, kind of the percent that's lost as a result of poor in-store execution. I actually personally would have thought that that number would have been higher, but you know, it's, in some ways it's a positive, but it also shows that with the right technology, uh, we can see some real changes that relates to, to top line and, and ultimately to the bottom line. So in the next slide, we talk about this idea of consistent in-store execution and cost pressures are key to store operation challenges. I don't think there, there's any um, surprises um, here, except that 81% of respondents cited delivering consistent in-store execution as a key challenge. And I, I think that once again, if retailers are able to execute every store, you know, according to you know, the, the mandates, it will drive more productivity, not only from the employees, uh, which we see as a kind of second uh, pressure here, um, but also productivity as it relates to the SKUs that you have in the store. 
the, you know, and I think right now, right, we're seeing a lot more around kind of BOPIS and click and collect. And, you know, this is still a challenge that, that retailers have faced and one that technology can absolutely um, help us uh, on the other side. Th this is fascinating, right? That there is this, this mismatch in store operations management. So most retailers do not consider store ops a strategic priority, you know, just 13% do. Whereas, you know, I, I think that retail, you know, management is dealing with so many different things that, and they see, right, the shoppers and the shopper experience. And so that is oftentimes, you know, number one, right? We see them put out more staff on the floor so that there's more interaction between the customers and the sales associates. However, uh, what we do see is 57% of respondents said in-store execution and the quality of the customer experience are the factors, you know, kind of senior managers, you know, kind of should focus on as the key performance factor. So definitely this mismatch, and, and we think there's an opportunity to figure out how to um, solve that, and the role of technology and store operations management is definitely, in our belief, what, what will assist there. The slide here, um, and once again, this was, you know, kind of done back in, in November, as we think about kind of store execution tracking tools and, and the adoption that's underway, 75% of respondents still rely on manual audits and stock count. I mean, how many times have you been in a store, right, David? And you, you know, you see people, right, like literally like on paper or this, you know, these huge spreadsheets. And so I, I think that this is just, you know, retail has a lot of legacy systems. So these are the challenges. Um, but also this, you know, right now as we're all kind of taking this pause, therein lies the opportunity to think about kind of the store of, you know, what's the store of tomorrow that we want? What's the future and, and how can we really reimagine retail? On the positive side, 52% uh, of respondents said advanced tools were their secondary method for store execution tracking. So that was uh, definitely kind of a positive. And then 69% are using computer vision already, either as a primary or secondary method to monitor store ops. So it's not that the technology is um, kind of so, so new to them, uh, but there may be new ways for them to use this um, and to think about, you know, kind of on-shelf availability, uh, which I think right now is truly the most important um, issue. I mean, even from a, um, a state perspective, right? I mean, to drive confidence for consumers, for retailers to get, right, our country kind of um, up and running and, and, and to have this kind of positivity that we all need, it starts with retail and it really starts with the grocers and making sure that they're in stock is so key. That's why the timing of this, David, I think is, is so important. Uh, you know, we are seeing this idea of um, these advanced tools giving better data to address in-store ops issues. And, you know, when asked about the availability of the right data to address specific store ops, retailers that use camera-based automatic shelf monitoring tracking methods have greater availability of key data to address operational issues. And I think that that's what's you know really key, and and we'll just I just want everyone to spend a moment on the slide to see some of the significant differences, um, you know, between a manual audit and a computer based, a camera based one. Okay, on this next slide, most retailers plan to adopt advanced tools for in-store operation management in the next two years, and I think this is incredibly positive. I do think that what we're seeing already in 2020 is a significant amount of interest around this technology and this idea that retailers want to be in stock for consumers to drive consumer confidence, to drive traffic, right? If this item isn't on your shelf, you may then risk losing that customer because we, we are seeing this unbelievable, you know, kind of proliferation of great online um, opportunities. So it is really important to have the, the product on your shelves and the consumers there. Um, I think this idea of no plans at just 6% is, you know, really kind of telling in terms of where we'll see the future of this idea of kind of um, computer vision in, in store operations. Okay, on this next slide, looking at inventory visibility as really a, a key application of these advanced tools is, I mean, I remember, so I've covered the retail industry a very long time, as you know, David, and I was always shocked. I mean, first of all, right, as a Wall Street analyst, you're like, gosh, retail, it's so simple. Like, why, why can't they just understand what's in the back, put it on their shelves, have greater sell-through? But what you realize, right, because of this, you know, kind of very manual process, 
it's incredibly challenging. And so this idea of, of inventory visibility, I mean, it, it really drives everything. So not only, right, if you have out of stocks, how to get back in stock, but also this idea of where do you kind of, you know, from a store staffing perspective right now, right, where do you put your, your sales associates? Is it in terms of, you know, kind of getting product back onto the shelves and, and do you have that inventory in stock? So this to me has been really a, a key focus of mine since I started covering the retail industry uh, more than a decade ago. So as we think about um, kind of disruption of existing operations, uh, data privacy and costs are the main barriers to adoption. So many of you know that um, we at CoreSight spent a lot of our time in uh, greater China. And you know, there, there is technology that's available to kind of better understand um, you know, kind of store ops and you know, data availability and um, kind of what's in the back and, and, and what's on the selling floor. And you know, what we're seeing here right in the West with, with the technology that's available and um, the, the data privacy options that we have, this more kind of gradual approach can you know, kind of help overcome barriers, not only for the customers, but also in the C-suite in terms of thinking about adoption. And you know, what we've seen here is 51% of respondents um, who are using these advanced tools are already rolling out this gradual approach. So we found that is the best way to operate from a customer perspective, but also as it relates to the C-suite. All right, so as we look at key insights and before I turn the, the floor over to David, um, you know, in-store ops from an efficiency perspective, and once again, it's you know, kind of efficiency around kind of your, your product, around your people, and you know, around kind of in-store um, kind of interaction as well. If you don't invest here, right, what we see is that poor store operations will definitely lead to sales loss. I mean, it's just common sense. This, this percentage around this 10 to 15% of sales lost every year to poor in-store execution, that's a significant number, right? I mean, with that, you'll think differently about investing. And, and those were some of the findings from this uh, kind of survey that we worked so closely with Prax to put together. As retailers are thinking about in-store execution, they are overlooking sometimes the importance of in-store ops. And it is very much, right, because we can see the customer, some of these in-store ops, right, it's this technology, right, it's kind of like, you know, the, the what's inside, right, it's, it, what, it's what ultimately drives you know, kind of the winners and the losers, and those who are the winners really think about everything in this, this ecosystem with store operations being, you know, kind of really um, at the front of the line in terms of investing and focus. You know, in-store tracking tools um, do give better data to address um, in-store ops issues. And once again, as I said, from the beginning of my career, this idea of improving inventory visibility, which once again, I was like, well, of course they can see it. They know what's in their store. They know what they brought in off the truck. They know where it is. They know if it's in the back. They know if it's on the shelf. Ultimately, this is really the, the key to, to success, um, not only you know, today, um, but also for the future of retail. Because I think right now in this environment, we are going to see consumers you know, continue to narrow where they shop and how they shop. And as a retailer, it's incredibly important to have what the customer wants when they make that decision you know, to come into your stores. So with that, David, I'll, I'll turn the floor over to you. And uh, thanks again for giving us this opportunity to, to discuss our findings with you. Great. All right, I am now sharing my screen. Hope that's visible to everybody. Um, and, and thanks so much, Deb, for your, your great research. And thanks for including me in this. For the record, I would much rather be sharing an actual stage with you in Las <laughs> Vegas than in my home office, but uh, you know, strange times we live in, so, so here we are. Um, so as Deb said, David Gottlieb, I lead Trax's business here in the Americas. Um, clicking through. So it, I think it's super interesting. The report that we put together with Coresight that Deb just did a great job walking us through really speaks to this, this kind of emerging trend and, and frankly the imperative that retailers start to consider technologies like uh, computer vision uh, as, a, as a basis for store automation to really help drive up uh, availability of products and, and shopper satisfaction and sales and all the good things that go along with that. And, and that research, as, as she mentioned, was done in the fall. And clearly we are in a different time now and it's, it's almost become cliche to, to say it, but uh, everything today is, is different. We're living in, a, in an unprecedented time, uh, especially with the impact on the retail environment. 
Uh, grocery retail is at the front line of, of dealing with trying to keep a largely contained population fed and, and supplied with basic necessities. Uh, and supply and demand are fluctuating wildly. And so what I'm gonna share is a little bit of color on, on Trax's perspective and what we've learned from our first party data um, to kind of build on what Deb talked about, but really to help you see how we're seeing the retail response to the pandemic and, and suggest perhaps that there may be an acceleration. Deb mentioned that most retailers are looking at this type of technology in the next you know, 12, 24 months. Uh, I think that the environment that we're in right now is perhaps gonna compress that timeframe as retailers get more aggressive about this type of digital transformation. So first looking at, at the data, what's the data telling us? And it, it's no secret that sales have been kind of off the charts in, in many categories. Uh, I was reading a report the other day, I think it was from IRI, which one thing jumped out at me, and that is that in the US and in Canada, the growth in sales year to date in 2020 has already outpaced the entire growth for calendar year 2019. So this is truly a, a, a time that is uh, it's almost like a black swan event. Nobody could have seen this coming. And as Deb mentioned, all of this growth isn't just coming from kind of traditional shopping patterns of in-store, you know, cash and carry retail. Uh, a lot of shoppers who are being asked to shelter in place are now exploring for the first time, perhaps, uh, what does it look like to order delivery online? What does it look like to do a BOPIS or click and collect order? And so all of that demand is, is creating real challenges for, for the retailers, um, not only in, in terms of its size, but in terms of the patterns that are not as predictable as they were before the pandemic. And, and sort of amplifying that is the labor issue. And so you've got a, an increasingly pressured workforce trying to work in these retail stores. Uh, you have employees who are, who are getting sick in some cases. Uh, you have other employees who perhaps don't feel, uh, don't feel safe and being on the front line. Um, and all of those, you know, all those people are trying to do their very best to, to uh, distance themselves from one another and from shoppers. And so all that together is creating real challenges for, for many retailers. Uh, I want to share with you an example from one specific store. And so this will, this will give you a sense maybe of how the tracks, tracks technology is illustrating some of these challenges. Um, here, here we have a, a typical beer category from a grocery store in the UK. And just to kind of orient you, what we're doing here is we've deployed our, our retail watch solution. In this case, we have fixed shelf edge cameras covering the entire beer category. We're measuring it hourly. So each hour pictures are taken, they're stitched together to create a full category view like you see here. Obviously this is quite small. Uh, and then from, from there, the real magic is not so much the image, but we're actually recognizing what's in that image down to the lowest level of detail uh, using our image recognition engine, so EAN or UPC, and that gives you lots of great data, um, not the least of which is availability. So what you can see here is on February 20th, kind of business as usual. If you look hard, you might find a few missing items or reduced number of facings, but generally a really good shopper presentation. If you fast forward now, here we are in mid-March, and to orient you time-wise, this is right around the time that the World Health Organization declared COVID-19 to be an actual pandemic. And so we see, you know, certainly shopper demand has increased, the shelf holding power is not keeping up very well. Uh, and we see a, a larger number of, of gaps and outs in the category, less shopper choice, less variety, et cetera. We fast forward again, here we are on March 20th, and this is right around the time that the UK government announced they were gonna be closing all of the pubs to public access. Uh, and that created an even bigger spike in demand and of course an even bigger corresponding uh, uh, impact to the shelf. And so here you see the shelf is completely blown out. Uh, there's not much choice, there's, there's not much availability. And of course, shoppers coming in at this point are gonna, are gonna feel that. And so the point I'm, I'm making here isn't so much that, hey, this technology is magical and it will help you not feel the impact of a black swan event like, like COVID-19, that's, that's not practical. But what I'm suggesting is these types of, of you know, supply and demand fluctuations are happening every day in every category in every retail store. And so imagine if you had, without having to send your associates walking through the aisles looking for outs, you just had a point in time view almost in real time of availability on the shelf and you could prioritize the associates activities against the items that are gonna be most impactful to shopper baskets, biggest profit drivers, biggest volume drivers, et cetera, and by doing that, really tighten the cycle. 
Uh, and so I thought that was going to be interesting. Um, if we if we turn our focus to the U.S., here we actually uh, sent out uh, our own our own sort of shopper driven crowd workforce to collect some data in in U.S. retail. We visited 300 stores in the last week of March, kind of mid April time frame. And some of this is is not surprising. M maybe some of it's more interesting, but. Uh, the categories that were at that time completely uh, difficult to find were the, the sort of panic categories as they've now become known. So toilet tissue, which I still don't totally understand why that became the top of everyone's list, but uh, you could not find toilet tissue in almost any stores. Uh, and then you have the home cleaning, home sanitizing, those categories were predictably uh, hard to find as well. But what's interesting, and you can see it in the light purple bars is during this time period, we also started to see some stock pressure on the, the kind of categories that, that include pantry loading, um, shelf-stable soups, pasta, other center store categories, and even fresh chicken, et cetera. We also asked uh, about 1,500 shoppers as they were going about their, their journey to help us understand sort of the relationship between what their intentions were and what they actually bought by category. And so this, to a degree, mirrors the previous slide. And you can see that uh, shoppers were significantly disappointed who went in to buy paper products and household cleaners. But again, we see that, that same gap um, to a lesser degree in some of the perimeter categories like dairy and fresh. And then again, you know, frozen and canned foods where we don't typically see uh, you know, significantly higher than like low single digit availability issues. We see them significantly uh, pronounced here. Another view of a category during COVID-19 is this look at the diaper category in a, in a big uh, grocery store. And just to orient you to the slide, uh, what I'm using here is actually data that we collect in one of our control stores. So usually, and we'll talk about this about uh, on the rollout piece, when we, when we do a, a, a test or a pilot with a retailer, we really want to help them and help ourselves isolate the, the specific value of this solution. And one of the ways that we do that is by creating an A-B test. And so what's interesting about this slide is it really gives us uh, an incredibly rich view of data and metrics about store performance during the early kind of weeks of the pandemic. Um, because what we're seeing is think, uh, data that's coming from tracks being measured by the track system, uh, but actually not being utilized by associates. So it's really a raw view of how does a store perform uh, without much technology intervention. And what you can see, the purple line is showing us shelf utilization or product availability. Uh, and you can see in the normal case, it's in the it's kind of high 80s, low 90s. Uh, it then begins to sharply dip down as the pandemic picks up and then really slowly recovers over the next kind of three to five weeks. Um, on the, on the, blue, the blue bars on the right axis, what you're seeing is uh, how long does it take for items that go out of stock to actually find their way back to the shelf? And this is really what we found with our customers. This is really unique. This is a, a metric and a data point that was never available really before you started looking at the shelf and looking at it more or less continuously. And it's a really good proxy for how much the shopper is being impacted by the lack of availability. And so again, what I think is interesting here is, is not so much the movement in availability, it's how long given sort of its normal operating processes, business as usual, how long does the store take to recover without the intervention of, of this kind of technology? Um, everything we've talked about today, uh, from a tracks perspective, I want to, to sort of make the point that uh, this is not something that's out in the future. This is, this is real, we're doing it today. Uh, we're very fortunate to be partnering with some of the world's uh, great retailers, uh, grocery and club. Uh, and uh, we have many more that aren't on the list yet, or aren't on the list here rather, we don't, we don't use their logos, but uh, you, you certainly may find this technology in a, in a store near you as, you as you do your normal shopping. So just to, just to share a bit more detail about how does the benefit actually accrue, I took this from one of our, our, our retail customers in Europe. And what we're doing here is really fighting specifically the on-shelf availability issue that Deb talked about. And so the way this is working is imagine that we have uh, images of a store coming in, in this case, two to three times a day. We're using a robot here. We're not using the fixed shelf edge cameras, but we have flexibility on where the, where the images come from. Each time the images come in, they're being analyzed. We're identifying what's missing from the assortment by category. 
and then we're making them making them visible to the associates who are responsible for that category on a mobile app like you see here uh, on the slide. And the important thing about that is it's not just a laundry list of all the missing items. It is filtered against what is available in the back room based on backroom quantity or on hand inventory. Um, and it's also prioritized by whatever variable in this case it's it's margin is most important to the retailer. And so by, by doing that, what we're seeing from an impact perspective is uh, roughly a $500,000 uh, increase in sales per store per year. And, and then coming along with that is an incremental benefit on productivity of roughly 100 to 150,000 per store. And that's really driven by being able to do more with scarcer associates. A side benefit that we didn't really talk about is because the, the technology identifies not only the product in the image, but also its corresponding tag shelf price, by matching that against the register price, we're able to eliminate uh, virtually all, all price mismatch issues where the shopper uh, buys something that has a price tag at the shelf that differs from the register price. So last, last data slide. Um, I think this is really important as you look, this is kind of a longer term uh, program we've been running with a retailer where we're measuring between a test and control group of stores product availability. And the headline here is in general, we see a meaningful improvement in availability across the store. It differs by category. This is an average, but roughly two and a half percent availability increase uh, over the life of this program. And in general, we see uh, about uh, for every, for every uh, three points of improvement in availability, you improve overall sales by 1%. So this is a meaningful number. But what's even more interesting is when you look at how the stores compare test and control, it's really in the trouble periods that the test stores perform much better. So those gaps between the blue line and the orange line, for example, in the, in the sort of October, November 19 timeframe where the control stores without the support of this technology really struggle on availability, shopper demand is picked up for some reason. And you see that they're dipping down into the kind of you know, mid high 80s the, during that same period, the test stores still maintain 90 plus percent availability at the shelf in those categories. Um, so to level up and just sort of net it out, um, I wanted to just discuss the, the, the sort of general use cases that we see most retailers gravitating towards for this technology. Um, not surprising, the first one we've talked a lot about, it's really blocking and tackling how do I increase OSA on shelf availability for my, my key categories. Um, related to that is how do I get more from my, my constrained set of in-store associates, my store resources. The, the third one is uh, how do I use this information to build a better supply chain, build a smarter supply chain. So Deb talked about this a lot. Most, uh, even the most sophisticated supply chains and computer assisted ordering systems are built on uh, perpetual inventory and the notion that that number is, is, uh, is correct and accurate and, and useful. And, and it, it can be a part of the story, uh, but not knowing what's on the shelf, what your shrink looks like, um, how, how often an item goes out of stock and how long that out of, out of stock persists and when during the day that happens, those are critical pieces of information to really fine tune uh, supply chain and store ordering and, and really unhook what's been historically that high single digit, even low double digit out of stock number for, for critical categories and start to really improve uh, shopper presentation at the shelf. And then finally, the fourth, the fourth one that we're seeing is, uh, and this kind of links to the, to the COVID movement towards or, or pandemic movement towards online ordering. Uh, as we have online ordering, it creates a need to be able to supply shoppers with a different set of information, right? The last thing you wanna do is have one of your shoppers go to the web, place an order, and then find out that half the items they, they ordered didn't show up because they weren't available. So imagine you could actually uh, sort of intercept that communication with the customer. And instead of them finding out after the fact and being disappointed, you knew, hey, five minutes ago, we had images that said this product was on the shelf. So we feel comfortable putting that uh, as an option for them, suggesting that it's an option. Or if we know we don't have it at the moment of customer interaction, imagine we can actually present alternatives at that point and how that manifests itself in a better customer relationship, better shopper experience, uh, better long-term value. So how might you get started? Um, the first piece I think is really getting your head around what's the most important business outcome for, for the retailer, for your business. 
of, of the ones we talked about, and there are, there are probably others we can discuss, but I think those are the ones we see emerging as the most frequently considered. Um, the second one is, uh, who do you want to partner with? Uh, of course, lots of technology companies have lots of different approaches to this sort of digital transformation. Uh, I think it's really important to look at uh, which, which technology companies can really do the work, who has the technical platform, who has the experience, who has the proven results, um, in, in our case, who has the global scale. So those are factors to consider. Uh, and then from a proven deploy model, what we've been um, really, I think, successful doing is working on, and I've alluded to this a couple times, um, not so much pilots, but what does it look like to build out a real test to do three to five stores over at least three months and really try and build a robust test and control model so that together we can work with our customers to really isolate the value of the technology uh, and make sure that everybody feels really good that this investment as we scale it out is going to pay off. Uh, and then finally, we move to roll out an expansion that can, that can look a bunch of different ways. We can go wide, and deep, or, wide or deep depending on what's, what, where we see the most value. Um, I'm going to close with just uh, a few points about tracks for those of you that aren't familiar with us. Uh, while we are newer to working directly with retailers, we're not uh, a, such a new company. Um, so we've been around for about 10 years. Uh, we were headquartered in Singapore with 20 offices worldwide. We have our global computer vision center of excellence in Tel Aviv, Israel. Uh, and we do business with uh, roughly 80% of the largest global CPG companies. So today you can imagine that same computer vision technology we talked about is providing them with insights and assistance as they execute in stores uh, worldwide. And really in the last 18 months or so, we've, we've very uh, carefully and deliberately adapted the technology to be fit for purpose to deploy inside of retail stores. Um, so with that, I will turn it back over to Deb, and I think we have time for some questions. We do. So for any of you who haven't yet used the Q&A function on the bottom of your screen, uh, please feel free to do so. We, we actually have quite a few questions in the queue, but I, I'd like to throw it out there to, to David to start. What we're hearing right now from retailers, right, is um, because so many in the grocers, right, so many orders are, are starting online, and whether that's by an online pickup in store or, or for last mile delivery, and so you've got multiple people picking for the most part from the same store. And what they're finding is that, you know, it's leading to a lot of confusion because you've got shoppers shopping, you've got pickers picking. How are you seeing tracks as a solution for that? And especially if the customer can kind of make sure that they, what they want to be available is in store. Can you help us think about that kind of from the top down? Cause I think it's, it's a major question on executives minds right now. Yeah. Yeah, I think there, there's two, there's sort of two models that I think we're seeing, take, taking even a, a step back. Um, some grocery retailers see that problem as, a, as, a, as sort of a real estate problem, meaning uh, their, their vision would be, hey, we're going to have stores that actually don't operate as cash and carry stores. We're going to take some of those stores and they're going to support just the click and collect business. So we're going to separate that demand and service it out of different outlets. Um, that's more so what we're seeing in Europe. In the U.S., uh, what you described is absolutely the case. I mean, if you shop at, for me in Colorado, I shop at King Supers, you definitely see the associates with that giant cart with multiple customer orders. Uh, the tracks support for that model is really to make it faster and easier for the, both for the associates and for the shoppers. So I don't know if you were at NRF this year in our booth, but one of the things that we were showing was um, what are some of the derivative technologies that we, that we can support once you've instrumented the store digitally? So imagine a grocery store that has, for example, the fixed cameras. So now we know not only what's available in stock at a point in time, we also know the location of each and every item in the category and in the, in the stores and all the departments that are instrumented. And that information really is the foundation for uh, an augmented reality experience for the, for the associates and for the shoppers. So imagine now the associate, instead of having to look at a list and sort of walk through the aisles, taking up space, taking up time and potentially impacting shoppers, imagine a, the, the Tracks app walking them through the store in the most logical way to fulfill all the orders on the cart. But not only that, allowing them to hold up their device, look at the shelf and then literally pop the items off of the shelf that are required to fulfill the list. 
So by doing that, um, I don't think we're going to eliminate the problem of contention between shoppers and pickers, but we can certainly make the pickers dramatically more efficient and reduce the amount of, of conflict and collision on, on, in the aisle. Okay, great. I have many more questions, but I want to make sure we get to all of those from our guests. Uh, so let's get started. And all right. There's so many good ones. Uh, can you tell us more about the device and the durability of where it gets placed? Uh, sure. I, I think that the question is probably about the fixed camera devices. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we're on, I, I guess I would say we're on generation two of the device. Uh, we work with a, a contract manufacturer that has built it as sort of an industrial hardened camera device. Um, I don't have a picture of it handy, but uh, only a very small part of the device, the way it's designed, is actually kind of visible at the edge of the shelf. All of the camera uh, innards, if you will, all the, all the mechanics are, are in a box that actually sits underneath the shelf. And, and so far, despite the, the thousands of them that we've got out there, we've had almost zero uh, issue with any of them being, you know, either stolen, which is a common question, damaged, or, or having to be serviced in the field. How are you working with dark stores in this environment with the growth in online? We are seeing a proliferation of retailers open dark stores. How is the track solution utilized best there? Yeah, so I think that's the, the question is really uh, specific to what I mentioned a minute ago about stores that are not actually um, open for shoppers to come in and, and walk through them. And it really, it really goes back to the answer I gave a minute ago, which is the technology in those stores would be to support the, the pickers and being more efficient by helping them navigate the store and find the items that are, that are important for the shop, shopper baskets. Uh, this is a good one and interesting. Uh, so some department stores have not invested in point of sale staffing, resulting in unsold inventory lying in the stock room. How can tracks help? Um, so department stores, we're talking about fashion retail, I, I assume. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, so, you know, candidly, Trax really has kind of a laser focus on fast moving consumer goods. So um, our, our fit for purpose technology is really aimed at more of the consumable products that you would find in mass, grocery, drug, discount, um, convenience retail. So the short answer is we, we probably wouldn't go after that problem. But uh, um, I, I would say if you wanted to use an artificial intelligence solution to solve that problem, there's certainly there's certainly room for that. Um, and I think the answer comes down to sort of the same, the same mechanism that we're talking about, which is if, if, you're, if you're looking at all of the store inventory and saying, hey, I know I've got backroom supply or I've got, I've got product on the sh on, on the, in the back room, um, I can't perhaps, I don't have enough labor to get all that product on the shelf. So how do I prioritize it based on a specific knowledge of what's missing and then looking at what, what the opportunity, what the value of closing those gaps is by category, by product, by SKU. I think that's the, that's the meth, that's sort of the thought process, even in department store that would make sense. Perfect. All right. How does a ton of shelf monitoring improve employee productivity? Can you please provide some examples? Sure, sure. So the example I gave in the presentation from Europe probably is a, is a good one. Um, and, and really it comes down to the before and after. So in the before model, um, you mentioned this with, with the pen and paper and the spreadsheets, most, most retailers today still have employees walking every aisle looking for shelf outs. And if you've ever done that, um, I actually worked in a grocery store as my first job. Um, it's, it's tiring. It can be boring. It's, uh, it takes a long time. And actually, you miss stuff, right? What we've seen in, in one of our customers in the UK is uh, the accuracy of that activity. While it might seem like, well, it's painful and expensive and it's brute force, but it'll be accurate. It's actually not that accurate because people get fatigued. They get asked questions by shoppers. They lose track of where they were on the shelf. You have items that are refaced in the wrong location, meaning you don't have a hole. So that activity takes a long time and it's very expensive. And so essentially what we're saying is if you can just not do that, if you can take for granted that the system is going to measure what's available in the aisle and then make that, make that available, make that expose that information to your associates, they can then focus on the value added labor of actually stocking the shelf, not on the non value added labor of figuring out what's missing. This is a good question. Uh, what about non packaged <laughs> goods like fresh produce. Yeah, huge. Um, I mean, certainly in most markets, we see the fresh, the perimeter as 
you, you know, really the, the area of the store that's driving shopper choice, right? Mo most shoppers, you know, if it's not price, it's, it's really, hey, what, what's the quality of the produce? What's the presentation look like? How's the meat look, et cetera? And so our, our solution for Fresh is a variant of what we talked about. Um, the only difference is uh, it, it's less focused on identifying skew level information because you know, fruit doesn't really have the notion of being skew driven, it's, it's PLU driven, et cetera. So here what we're looking at is um, based on the specifications and constraints of each retailer, we want to identify availability in, in sort of chunks, right? So do I have full presentation of my, of my oranges? Am I down to half or less? Am I down to you know, less than 10%? And those triggers can drive the appropriate behavior because I think what's interesting about Fresh is we see presentation itself as a sales driver, right? So people are less likely to buy when inventory goes below 50% and the, and the, the display starts to look sparse. Well, stack it high and watch it fly, right? <laughs> exactly. exactly. Um, so how does the application work with scheduling software and task management software? Um, so what, what we provide is two things. For, for grocers who don't have their own labor scheduling task management, we have a mobile app that I showed in, in my presentation. For those who do, we have effectively an open architecture that allows them uh, retailers to pull from our API so that all of the, the data and events and triggers are available to be fed into those task management solutions uh, as the primary employee communication tool. Okay. Um, this is a good one. Will smaller tier manufacturers have the same availability to information on a store level basis as top tier manufacturers? Um, so it's, it's not, I guess, just to orient, the, the solution that, we, that we're talking about today is our retail solution. So that question really is a function of how much our retailer partner or customer wants to engage the trade in, in solving problems. I think generally the bias as we've engaged retailers is to do that. So in other words, they look at this and say, hey, if I wanna solve a shelf issue, yes, there are point in time things I can do to increase availability like we've talked about, but on the supply chain side, if I wanna look more broadly at you know, store level forecasting and DC supply, those problems are best solved in partnership with the trade. And so I think there is absolutely a trend towards retailers making that type of information available to suppliers so that together they can, they can work to build better plans to solve, to solve those availability problems. But it's, it's, less, it's less about tracks and, and how we think about it. And it's more about each individual retailer and how much they feel comfortable sharing. So I would expect it's, it's gonna follow the lines that you see today where some retailers, you know, Walmart famously with Retail Link, uh, et cetera, are, are very open, others uh, less so. So I think that those, those trends will continue in those cultures where they exist today. Okay. Uh, I'm a grocer with over 50 stores in the U.S. How can I use a tool like Trax to better leverage my store network to fulfill increasing online demand? Um, so from a size perspective, the, the, the technology scales up and down, I would say, really well. Um, probably the important thing to understand is with, with computer vision technology in general and really any AI driven technology, the, you know, much of the effort is in how do you build a, a training set? So how do, you, how do you build your master data in such a way that you can reliably recognize items in each category and in each department? And so for, for smaller retailers, I think the question just becomes, is the, is the juice worth the squeeze? Is there enough value and sales impact in a smaller chain to justify that upfront cost? But other than that, the technology scales up and down just fine. All right, well, we have many more questions in the queue. I'm gonna pick two of them and then I will show the rest of them with you, David, later. Uh, so sure. how would shelf, this is a great question, how would shelf data have helped me during the worst weeks of coronavirus? Yeah, so I think, you know, in a practical sense, as, as I described earlier, this is not a, a panacea. It's not a, it's not a solve for everything. And, and what I mean by that is if there's no toilet paper in the store and your supplier has, you know, manufacturing issues with product, there, there's not a lot we can do to help. What we can do to help is when, when shoppers are, are coming into the store in unprecedented volumes, we can help you really by prioritizing which gaps are the most important to fix so that you can have that you can present the best possible experience to the shopper during that period. And I think we saw that in the slide that I showed that had the test and control stores and those gaps that varied more widely between test and control during periods of spike demand. That's exactly what we'd expect to see 
uh, during the COVID period for stores that have, that have, that have instrumented this technology. All right, I, I actually may do two more questions. This is a good one. Um, I'm seeing out of stock issues in our stores today. How quickly could I implement tracks to solve those issues? Uh, so I would say the implementation window, it, it takes about, as I mentioned a minute ago, so there's, there's sort of this upfront piece to build and configure the system, and then we start deploying stores. Um, you can imagine it's about 12 to, to 15 weeks to get that first environment stood up. And then from there, depending on the size of the store, you know, it's, it's days to, to start installing store after store after store. And then from there, it's not, it, it, incrementally, it's not a lot more technology work to add more stores. It's just labor to go out and install the cameras, which takes days or, you know, could be a few days, depending on the size of the store format. Okay. Um, I'm going to close out with this question. As a retailer, how can a solution help me speed up my time to market to prevent out of stocks and improve on shelf availability? What's the aspect of predicting demand versus the analytics or by the analytics? Um, okay, I'm not sure I totally understand the question, I but think I think like what the they're demand, actually, David, it, it's interesting because we have had a, a huge spike in terms of interest around demand forecasting. And, and I think that that's why I wanted to end on this question because across all sure. of the you know, kind of digital events we've hosted, demand forecasting has been the biggest challenge for retailers. And so I think it's interesting because I, I do think that this question kind of alludes to that, right? How can they predict okay. demand via the analytics? And just, you know, yeah. it's, I, I will tell you it's weighing on people. So, you know, kind of however you, you think that tracks can yeah, work yeah. with them, it, it's a huge issue right now. Uh, totally. So I think this, this goes to the heart of what, what this solution is all about. So if you look at historically, we talked about a little bit, really sophisticated forecasting engine, demand forecasting engines, really sophisticated store ordering. All of them are built on uh, essentially, as you talked about, scanning into the back room, scanning out of the front of the, you know, the register, and the, the delta is what you sold. And I think despite everybody's best effort at using statistical models and applying you know, really smart demand curves, we still in the industry deal with you know, high single digit, low double digit data stocks, depending on the category you're looking at. Yeah. And our argument would be that what's really missing is a clear direct view of product in the store on the shelf at any point in time, because the problem with perpetual inventory and using that as the basis for forecasting is that it's almost by default always wrong, right? You have, you have shrink, you have, uh, you have product that is in different locations in the store. All those elements make it really, really hard to predict demand. And so having an objective, so almost like a shopper view of the shelf, yeah. of displays, of the store is uh, a missing ingredient that we think can help close that high single digit gap significantly when deployed at scale. Does that well, make sense? All, yeah, no, but it's actually really interesting. I, I like how you put that, that shopper view, because if you go back to, to the survey that we did, right, basically making shoppers happy was kind of at the top of the list for, for executives versus yeah. thinking about store ops. So, so that's exactly right. So if, if we can somehow frame it that this is what shoppers see and this is why this is important, it's, uh, uh, we'll leave on that note. We couldn't get better than that. David, thank you so Great. much. I've learned so much and I really enjoyed it. Thanks again and we'll see you soon. Thanks, Deborah. My pleasure. Thank you.